Um, I would like to welcome now Laura Rosenwald um, calling in from the National Pest Management Association. Um, I'm going to have to ask you, Laura, what time is it there for you now? Uh, it is a ripe 5.14 in the morning. Here. <laughs> okay, and it, you've probably been up for a little while as well, so that's a very I early have. morning. And I really have. Yeah, really appreciate you joining us today. Um, and, I will yeah. say it was the easiest commute I've ever had coming into the <laughs> office. <so. laughs> That's it. It's kind of, oh, wake up, get up, turn the computer on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. indeed. Um, I'm good. At least that's uh, um, uh, one good thing. But yeah, happy uh, World Pest Day to yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you. The most um, auspicious of days, as Stephen said. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, and we, you're going to be talking about how bacteria can influence pest management. So, do you know what? I'll leave you to it and I'll let you explain okay. a bit more about awesome. it. Yeah, okay. let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Can we all see that? Uh, there we go. There we go. I'll tell you when it's, there we go, it popped up. Okay. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I am very excited to be speaking on behalf of the National Pest Management Association here today. Um, so this talk that I'm going to give is actually a little bit on my background. So this is based on work that I did when I was in graduate school. So it's very much a topic that is near and dear to my heart. So I hope you all enjoy it as much as I do, because again, very near and dear to my heart. So when we think about bacteria and pest management, I think a lot of us have a tendency to kind of think about pest management with bacteria kind of like this, right, where it is the enemy that we're trying to eliminate. We are often charged with the responsibility of eliminating X pest in order to prevent Y disease. And this clearly has been the thought for a very long time. I mean, considering that this poster is from World War II, but, you know, I would argue that this has been our charge for a while anyway because of the fact that ever since we knew how bacteria are transmitted from pests to people, it's been really important in the grand scheme of things. But my challenge to you today is going to be thinking a little bit more about what about using bacteria as pest management? So the main question that we're gonna try to answer today is, are we leaving something on the table that's naturally there that could be really beneficial to us as pest management professionals? Could that be another tool in our toolbox? So bacteria are really found everywhere in the world. I mean, they're found in the deepest ocean thermal vents all the way to the highest mountain peaks, and we've even documented bacteria in space. But one of the more intriguing places that I think that we find bacteria, maybe I'm a little biased in this, is that we often find bacteria inside their arthropod hosts. So they live in the cells of these arthropods fairly commonly, and these Bacteria or viruses are called endosymbionts. So why, why should you care about endosymbionts? Well, it turns out that endosymbionts actually play a pretty wide variety of roles in their arthropod hosts. So for example, in some cases, endosymbionts can be really beneficial to their arthropod hosts. And a great example of this is actually going to be in P. aphids where we have two endosymbionts that are considered to be good in the grand scheme of things. So some symbionts are obligate symbionts, and a great example of this, at least in the P. aphid, and actually any aphid species that we talk about, is Buchnera aphid cola. So Buchnera is found in every single aphid species, and what Buchnera actually does is that it provides the aphid with essential amino acids that are normally missing from the diet of the P. aphid otherwise. And in return, the P. aphid gets a nice cushy home to live in. And at this point, these two are so evolutionarily intertwined that neither can exist without the other. So both of them need each other for survival at this point. Hence the name obligate symbiont because they are both obligated to be with each other. But then there are some endosymbionts that kind of act like little shields where they're defensive symbionts, where they confer protection to their arthropod hosts. So the one in P. aphids is actually this one called Hamiltonella defensiva. And what Hamiltonella defensiva actually does is that it confers protection against parasitic wasps. So aphids are very susceptible to parasitism. These wasps will go along, stab the aphid and inject an egg into the aphid the wasp will develop inside the aphid and eventually will emerge into an adult and will emerge from the aphid, killing the aphid off. 
But what Hamiltonella defensiva does is that it actually prevents that egg from establishing inside the aphid host. And so the aphid is able to go around merrily along, even though it got stabbed by this wasp, in none the wiser because of Hamiltonella defensiva. But interestingly, there are a lot of other symbionts out there that confer protection to their arthropod hosts. And some symbionts may protect against fungi, pathogens, and even environmental stress like pesticides. So there's some interesting studies coming out now that may suggest that the endosymbionts that these arthropods have may be conferring some kind of protection against um, these pesticides that we're trying to use. But then there are some endosymbionts that are pretty detrimental to their arthropod hosts, and not only in the sense that they can be pathogens, but also in the sense that they can just be kind of bad news bears if you happen to get infected with one. So a great example of this is actually iridiovirus, which is this virus, oops, excuse me, um, that turns these isopods this bright blue purple coloration. And actually this can infect multiple arthropods, but we're illustrating it here in these isopods today. But you can tell, I mean, you would be pretty easy pickings compared to your buddy over here who happens to not be infected because you're way more evident against a leaf litter compared to your friend who's not. So you're going to be way more evident to predators and things like that. But then there are these endosymbionts that kind of fall in the in-between spectrum where they don't necessarily benefit the host, but they also don't necessarily take away from the host either. So a great example of this is actually Rickettsia rickettsii in ticks. So there's a couple of tick species that feature this. And while in the tick, the Rickettsia rickettsii doesn't actually benefit the tick, but it doesn't really take away from the tick either. But this endosymbiont can cause problems down the line in, say, a human host, where it is the causative agent for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is actually the second highest uh, common or second most common, excuse me, um, tick-borne illness that we have in the United States behind Lyme disease. And it actually is increasing rapidly in the United States, which is pretty worrying, um, especially with the spread of these ticks also increasing rapidly thanks to climate change. But I would also argue that we should care about endosymbionts because the most recent estimates have suggested that endosymbionts infect 50 to 80% of all arthropods. So that's a pretty huge chunk of these invertebrates that we're dealing with, right? So this really begs the question, are we leaving something on the table that could be really beneficial to us as pest management professionals? So a lot of these endosymbionts are passed on through the mom. So whatever your mom has, you'll inherit her bacterial community as her offspring. But there are some endosymbionts out there that are particularly clever about the way that they get passed on to the next generation. And they have the ability to reproductively manipulate their own hosts in order to make sure that they get passed on to the next generation. Probably the most infamous of all of these is Wolbachia which is seen here in this cell here. So these are the circles that you see here. That's the Wolbachia in this cell. And it's estimated that Wolbachia infects 30 to 60% of all arthropods. But the more we're beginning to learn about Wolbachia and how it does these reproductive manipulations, the more we're beginning to understand that Wolbachia do not walk alone in the sense that they're not the only endosymbionts out here causing these reproductive manipulations in these arthropods. And in fact, there's a whole suite of these endosymbionts out there that are doing very, very similar things. So in order to try and study all of these reproductive manipulators and all of these symbionts and understand how they might interact with each other inside of a host, we need to ask the question, which arthropods have the most endosymbiotic diversity? Because this gives us kind of an open platform, an open stage, if you will, to try and play around with maybe taking one of these endosymbionts out and seeing how that kind of messes up or disrupts the ecology inside of the host and how that might transfer over to those reproductive manipulations that we're seeing in these arthropods. So it turns out that the answer to this question is, Spiders. <laughs> so spiders, for whatever reason, have some of the greatest endosymbiotic diversity in arthropods. We're not entirely sure why this is the case. It's suggested that maybe because spiders are apex predators, that they're kind of a little bit like Thanos from the Marvel Universe, if you happen to be a fan of Marvel, collecting all of the Infinity Stones. But 
it's just really hard to say. I, I mean, overall, we know that these have been in spiders for a pretty long time evolutionarily, but why this has become the case, why they're kind of collecting all these endosymbionts is, is sort of a question that still needs to be determined. So this is actually where I come into the picture. So my study organism happened to be this tiny little sheet weaving spider called Mermesis fradiorum, which is a member of the Linifeid family, um, which are which are again the sheet weaving spiders. They're also frequently called money spiders on occasion. But just to give you a perspective on how small these guys are, I mean that is a, a straw that we put in there in their containers for a little bit of stabilization for them to build their webs in. So, um, and then this is actually a picture of me out in the field <laughs> uh, looking for said spiders. So you can say I definitely got very much up and close and personal with them. But previous studies in our lab had shown that these guys do have multiple reproductive manipulations going on. So the question became, well, who is doing those re reproductive manipulations in these tiny little spiders that we just happened to find out in alfalfa fields in Kentucky? So in these spiders, we brought them in from the lab, um, from these alfalfa fields. And actually, I forgot to mention this spider is cosmopolitan. So it's actually found all over the world. So also indicating how common that this can all be. But anyway, so we brought these spiders in from the field. We quickly found out that these guys were actually infected with up to six different potential reproductive manipulators. And so we're seeing some kind of familiar faces among the crowd here. So, no, you know, we've seen these Wolbachia strains here. So the different strains of bacteria can kind of be thought of like different flavors is the best way to describe it, or, or, you know, themes on a variation, I guess. So, and then we also had uh, two strains of Rickettsia, which are a known reproductive manipulator. But what really intrigued us was this strain of Rickettsiella. And so when we went to go look at um, this Rickettsiella specifically, we were even more intrigued because every single spider that we brought in from the field happened to be infected with Rickettsiella. And so when we went to go look at the literature about what Rickettsiella does in these arthropods, we kind of got a mixed bag because it turns out that Rickettsiella actually wears a bunch of different hats in the arthropod world. So for example, it was actually first described in crickets as a pathogen that attacks the central nervous system. But in P. aphids, it actually was described as a mutualist that is thought to confer protection to the aphids because it changes their coloration over time, which is thought to confer protection against predators whose color vision also changes over time. Rickettsiella has also been documented in ticks, but what it is doing in ticks, no one really quite knows yet. We just know that it's there. But no one had documented whether or not Rickettsiella was a reproductive manipulator or not. So that was kind of the, the main goal of this study. So when we looked at reproductive manipulation in Mermesis fradiorum, these endosymbionts have a bunch of different party tricks that they're kind of able to do. So in the spiders, we were actually seeing two different kinds of these party tricks that I like to call them. So we were seeing this one called feminization and this other one called cytoplasmic incompatibility, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute. But so of the spiders that were only infected with Rickettsiella, we were pretty sure that we weren't seeing feminization out of the mix because feminization is exactly what it sounds like. So when you see feminization, every single member of the offspring that that mom produces will be female. But of the spiders that were only infected with Rickettsiella, we were seeing a pretty even split down the middle in terms of males versus females. So that is a pretty good indicator that feminization isn't what is happening here. And so the question for us really became, well, is it causing this cytoplasmic incompatibility? So cytoplasmic incompatibility was actually first described in Wolbachia. So this is one of Wolbachia's first party tricks that it was documented to do. And it actually was first described in Culex pipiens or the common house mosquito. So cytoplasmic incompatibility is what we call a conditional sterility phenotype which is essentially a very fancy way of saying it matters who you mate with. And so when we look at this with blue representing infected individuals and black representing uninfected individuals, if you create these crosses, you'll see where the reproductive manipulation comes up. So if we have two infected individuals mating, they will produce infected offspring just fine. If we have two uninfected individuals mating, they will produce offspring just fine. If we have an infected 
female mating with an uninfected male, they will produce offspring just fine. Because remember, these guys are passed on through the mom. So it really matters what the mom happens to be infected with. So even though the male doesn't have the Wolbachi in the scenario, the mom does. And so that's still getting passed on to the next generation. The problem arises when we have an uninfected female that happens to mate with an infected male. In this case, the Wolbachia modifies the sperm. And so then when these two individuals mate, the sperm goes into that uninfected female, but there is no Wolbachia to kind of unkink that modification. And so because of this, the sperm isn't able to fertilize those eggs. And so therefore we don't have any offspring hatch out from that cross. So for the spiders that were only infected with Rickettsiella, we essentially did the same experiment. We essentially set up the same crosses. So I played a lot of Barry White for these spiders in the lab. <laughs> um, but uh, so we essentially created these crosses that would predict whether or not we're seeing uh, cytoplasmic incompatibility from Rickettsiella in Mermesis fradiorum. So really what you can think about is the left hand of the screen as the predictions for this experiment, and then I'll bring up the results on the right hand of the screen. So if we had two infected individuals infected with Rickettsiella mating, we had 99.7% of those spider lengths hatch out. If we had two uninfected individuals mating, we had 83.9% of those spider lengths hatch out. An infected female that happened to mate with an infect, uninfected male, we had 91.3% of those spider lengths hatch out. But <laughs> when we had the uninfected females mate with the infected males, we only had 13.2% of the spider lengths hatch out. This was a very good day in the lab. <laughs> So this really doesn't happen a lot in science where you happen to have your predictions almost completely match your results. I This was just an astounding day. So um, a very good day in science and, and it was my peak of my career and I will, I will never recover from that. So, <laughs> but this was really exciting for multiple reasons, not just because I got science right one day, but Number one, it's only the fourth bacteria to ever be shown to cause cytoplasmic incompatibility. So that's kind of wild when you think about it, because there's a lot of bacteria in this world that, um, that in the grand scheme of things, and this has only been the fourth one ever to show um, to be con to be causing cytoplasmic incompatibility. And also, in addition to that, it is the first bacteria in its clade to cause cytoplasmic incompatibility as well. So this now means that we're talking a about a completely separate part of the evolutionary tree of bacteria that is suddenly able to do this trait. So what this suggests is that this may be way more widespread than we previously appreciated. So <laughs> I'm sure some of you are kind of looking at me like this, like what does this have to do with me? I'm just a pest management professional. Why should I care about all of these endosymbionts that you're talking about, Laura? So my challenge to you today is, what if we could use these endosymbionts to our advantage? So here's my pitch to you. Number one, they are specific to their arthropod hosts, so there's no impacts on human health, beneficial insects, any way, shape, or form of them getting into the environment. They are extremely common, like I talked about. I mean, the most recent estimates, again, have suggested that they infect 50 to 80% of all arthropods, or at least some kind of endosymbiont. And I would argue that they're already doing the hard work for us, and they really have been for a very long time. So, you know, why why mess it with it if it's not broke in, in the grand scheme of things? So actually, there are a couple of companies, at least in the United States and a little bit abroad as well, who have started to kind of try to use this technology for management. Specifically, we're going to be talking about this in mosquitoes. So a couple of years back, there were a couple of people that were able to find this strain of Wolbachia in Aedes aegypti, so uh, that caused the cytoplasmic incompatibility. But what some researchers also found was that Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquito, actually does not have Wolbachia naturally at all. So it is not naturally found in, in, in Aedes albopictus at all. So what some scientists were able to do was actually take that Wolbachia from Aedes aegypti that caused cytoplasmic incompatibility and put it into Aedes albopictus. So this isn't even genetically modifying the mosquitoes in any way, shape, or form. It's literally just taking one strain of bacteria and putting it into a different mosquito. 
And so what we were able to do, or at least these scientists were able to do is use CI in our favor. So once again, using that cross that is going to not produce offspring, so that uninfected female mating with that infected male. So they're able to produce these infected males in the lab and then release the infected males into the environment where they'll mate with these uninfected females. And then by that means we'll have population control because again, that sperm and that male is modified. And so when it meets an uninfected female, it's unable to be reset. And so therefore the um, eggs won't be fertilized and then you'll have population control that way. And also, at least in mosquitoes, this is a great cell because males don't bite, right? They only feed on flowering plants and nectar. Um, so they're actually pretty good pollinators in that regard. And there's no pesticides involved in any way, shape, or form. And again, the Wolbachia can't survive outside of the host. So once the male dies, it's a dead end for that Wolbachia. There's nothing else that the Wolbachia will be able to do in the environment past that. And as an added bonus, at least, you know, if it does happen to get out into the environment, at least in yellow fever mosquitoes, those Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, Wolbachia reduces transmission of Zika virus, chikungunya, dengue fever, and malaria. So these are pretty horrible diseases that we'd at least be able to mitigate a little bit with those Wolbachia infection in these mosquitoes. So other candidates in the pest management world that we could potentially use this Wolbachia for. <clears throat> so number one, we do have Wolbachia does infect fruit flies, Mediterranean flower moths, and German cockroaches. But I'm the first one to admit that there are a lot of details that need to be ironed out before we, you know, say, release more German cockroaches into a situation. But um, at least for Mediterranean flower moths, this could be a really beneficial way for dealing with really bad infestations in say warehouses where you know you may not be able to get into certain crevices and cracks where they might be hiding and the mediterranean flower moths the adults don't feed so they would be able the males at least would be able to find the females better than we would be able to find them so that would be a good means of trying to kind of cut that off at the head along with other management practices that would be common in stored product pests but also you know i found this Rickettsiella that caused cytoplasmic incompatibility in this tiny little spider in these alfalfa fields in Kentucky. And I think this really emphasizes that there could be other candidates out there that we could be using. I mean, also, we have documented Rickettsiella and tick. So could this be a potential means of tick management in the grand scheme of things? But overall, I kind of want to just emphasize that I think we're kind of looking at a blank canvas right now, right? Um, and we have all of these wonderful paints that we have yet to paint with on that blank canvas. So there's a lot of these endosymbionts out here that are causing these really cool reproductive manipulations in their arthropod hosts. And it's kind of the thought that maybe we're just leaving that canvas blank, but there could be something that we could be doing with that blank canvas that's already there. So just to wrap this up, um, bacteria can be extremely influential to their arthropod hosts and often in ways we can't see. And I hope that my talk today has really emphasized that to you all. <clears throat> and not to, to hammer this point home, but I really do think that uh, integrated pest management strikes again, kind of shaking my fist a little bit about this one. You know, especially as pest management professionals, I think we, we often have a tendency to go in to get the job done. And that is totally fair. But are we leaving something on the table that could be really useful to us in the grant in our pest management scenarios? Understanding bacteria and their impacts is critical to pest control and also vector management. So the more we're able to understand how these bacteria are interacting within their hosts, the better grasp we're going to be able to have in understanding how transmission occurs and how we can prevent these diseases in the future. And I'm the first one to admit that there are a lot of unanswered questions in all of this. I fully recognize that this talk is a little bit pie in the sky, invisible plane. But overall, I think it looks very promising. I think there's a lot that's coming down the pipe that's really going to be pretty influential in terms of pest management. And I think this is something that could be really beneficial to a lot of um, people in the world. So overall, what I'd like to leave you with today is that I hope I have convinced you that bacteria are not necessarily the enemy, but are something that is ready to get to work for you. So 
Um, I have a lot of people to thank. Um, number one, the lab crew throughout the years. Uh, also the Kentucky growers who were very kind about me traipsing around their alfalfa fields looking for spiders. Um, the Kentucky County agents that put me in contact with those growers and also my committee members um, from my graduate studies as well. Um, and I will happily take any questions if anybody has any. That's great, Laura. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting to see about the development and the different technologies that um, the pest management world is, is trying to come up with. I mean, I don't know about over in the US, but certainly UK and Europe, we're, we're, we're losing a lot of things um, to use within yes. you know, <laughs> toolbox and we're fighting for a lot of things and yeah it's, it's promising to see that you know there, there's research and studies and tests going on to try and find some other other um ways of dealing with them i mean just from my point just to, out of interest if this was to become something that can be used as a you know a technician out in the field how would it be delivered would it be like bait based or just just again i know it's all pie in the sky stuff as you said there but yeah, I mean, well, right now, um, at least for the mosquitoes, the the adult males are just released. They're just you're in a yeah. they're in a tube and you just wave it around. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it could be bait based. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just really hard to say right now, just because the stuff yeah. is so new, and you know, we're mm -hmm. just really like within the last ten years starting to get a better grasp on on these endosymbionts and how they're affecting these arthropods. So yeah. um, I think I think we need a little bit more understanding on the basics before we we fly the invisible plane. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Rather than getting a big jar of German cockroaches and releasing them, yeah, them yeah. into a place that's already infested, they'd be like, "What are you doing?" But yeah, no, I. I hand up I would be like no take those away no that's that's so interesting um actually there's a couple of questions that have popped up so um what is the most common um embosymbion uh that's from yeah uh, a question there Ooh, um <laughs> yeah man you guys really have some hard hitting questions. honestly honestly hard hitters <laughs> like to test you you see we think what can we ask that might trick yeah. you <laughs> yeah um well, I'd say of the ones that do reproductive manipulation, it's probably Wolbachia. Um, that that is arguably the most common one. Um, but again, it's just so new that we kind of don't really know. And I don't know that I could give you a really good answer on that. And in terms mm -hmm. of the other endosymbionts, I mean, that's a whole different ball game too. Um, you know, the ones that are doing the the defensive things for their hosts, the ones that are acting as pathogens. Um, as well the in-between ones that also can cause disease i mean there's just there's so many out there that again i think we're just really trying to just scratch the surface yeah. on, on it all so yeah indeed i mean again this is you're gonna be like no stop asking me these questions <laughs> i mean i say timeline i mean is, is this you know months or years or decades down the line that this might kind of come about as something that could be utilized yeah, yeah. So again, with the mosquitoes, they're actually already using this. Um, there's a couple of companies out there that that have this mm -hmm. um, patented, um, and it's registered with the EPA. So they they are able to to release it. Um, the EPA registration is a little kind of funky because it. Um, so again, it's its own category in terms of EPA re registration, but it's the category is like bacteria of unknown origin because it's, you know, they've just evolutionarily been there the entire time that the EPA kind of didn't really know how to categorize it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. hopefully this opens the door for, for more things like that. But, but yeah, like I said, the, the mosquitoes they're already using, um, they, there's a couple of places I know at least. Um, so they were using it at a company in Kentucky, um, for residential treatments. Um, and they're also using it um, in uh, Florida for, for some studies as well. And, and I believe that there's a, also another company that is doing this kind of more worldwide as well um, and trying to do it a little bit in Africa and, and some of the more tropical locales. So yeah, um, yeah. So, so it is being used right now. It's just on a very, very small scale. Um, but I think residential treatments would probably be the best option, at least for mosquitoes. Um, yeah yeah indeed yeah always a big concern we're we're always worried about the asian tiger mosquito uh over here with you know we don't we don't want to find too many of them keeping an eye out but uh yeah you know, we, we same. <laughs> yeah. same over here <laughs> that's it that's it um it's all good fun um we've got mohammed here asked the question I, i'm not sure whether again i'll read it out again <laughs> no if, if it's not something you you can or want to answer no problem but any details regarding e coli or streptococcus or rodents urine or related things um, yeah, so I mean, there's, 
not really a whole lot going on with that as far as I know, at least from my background. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, obviously these are really important things that we need to, to remember with rodents and, and that's a really hard, um, you know, that's basically the main thing with rodents that we have to be careful about with yeah. the spread of disease and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so admittedly, I am not very much into rodents. I am definitely more a bug nerd. So I apologize yeah. for that. But but yeah, I mean, the, the spread of disease is always something that we need to, yeah. to be considerate of. And we always have our, our favorites. And that's the thing is the insect world is such a huge world, you know, yes. um, focusing <laughs> on it's important to, to have people like you that, that do focus in on it because it's, you know, it's a there's a lot to it. Um, Ted here said, when could we see your studies implemented in the field on a day-to-day -day basis? So, so yeah, sort of, I kind of mm -hmm. asked that a little bit there, but it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, again, it's, it's very low key right now. I, I, there's really only like two or three companies off the top of my head that I can name that are doing this kind of stuff right now. Mm -hmm. You can find them online. I won't mention them here because I don't, um, but yeah, they're, um, they're doing things right now. So it's, it's important possible that this could become more widespread for sure but again i very pie in the sky but i i always like to talk to to pest management professionals about this because i think you guys should know about the stuff that we're doing up in the ivory tower necessarily yeah. so um yeah. so i think you guys should know about this stuff because a it's super cool at least i think it's super cool but b you know have an idea of what's coming down the line for you all Indeed, yeah. I know only through a lot of our initial training and, and throughout careers in pest management in the UK, biological control is always considered, you know, it's always mentioned, but really it's not something that's reality, you know, in terms right. of what we can use and implement. So, yeah, I think it's an important subject for everyone to keep a, keep an eye on. And it'd be wonderful to have you back again at some point and uh, yeah. Yeah, have some more, more news for us. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I'd love right. to. Thank you Maybe so much. Maybe a more reasonable time in the morning for you. Maybe we can push you on to the, yeah. the later on slot so it's not so heavy. I, I got the coffee. It's fine. Got the we coffee. Can make it. Great. Well, thank you again, Laura, so, yeah. so much. Um, no, are you carrying you on so with your work day now or are you going to go and have a little rest for a bit? I haven't decided if I'm going to take a nap under my desk or something. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a quick nap. That's it. That's it. I wouldn't blame you. But yeah, thank you again so, so yeah. much. Um, yeah, and if course. you can ever return the favor, let us know. And it was wonderful to have you. Yeah. No, thank you for the invitation. This was really awesome. No problem. Take care, Laura. Thank you. Thanks.